This is NASA astronaut Joseph P. Allen, the first and only person to have wrestled a satellite. And right before this, Joe also became one of the very few human beings to ever float freely in outer space with only a jetpack to control his movements. Now you might be wondering, what exactly led to Joe having such an eventful day at work? Well, Joe and his crew are on a rescue mission in space. This is the kind of thing that NASA did in the 80s. It's a mission that you would never see today. The technology to do something like this doesn't even exist anymore. But for a fleeting time in the early days of human spaceflight, it felt like NASA could do anything. And there's no better example than the story of the twin satellite rescue. This all started in February 1984 on the 10th flight of the Space Shuttle program and the first test of NASA's Manned Maneuvering Unit, or MMU, a jetpack-like propulsion system designed to help astronauts maneuver during spacewalks. It's essentially a personal spacecraft. There was no ISS at the time, so the astronauts didn't have anywhere in particular to go, but the idea was that they could fly from the shuttle over to another satellite or spacecraft. The astronauts steer using two joysticks, and those control 24 small thrusters all around the backpack that release a small burst of nitrogen gas. One hand controls rotation, and the other joystick directs the astronaut up, down, forward, and back. On the first test flight of the MMU, we got this iconic photograph of astronaut Bruce McCandless floating high above the Earth, completely untethered from the spacecraft, the first person in history to do this. And it's the kind of image that inspires a wide range of emotions. There's the adventure and inspiration of it all, going where no one had gone before, being more free than any human being had ever been, but it's also kind of terrifying. No person had ever been so alone, so vulnerable, so exposed to the infinite madness of the universe. Now, Bruce and his crew didn't go all the way to space just to play with jetpacks. Their shuttle also released two new satellites into orbit, Palapa B-2 and Westar 6. Now, there wasn't anything extraordinary about either of these communication satellites, other than they were pretty big and extremely valuable to the people who had spent millions of dollars to get them into space. On a typical mission, there would be nothing special about launching a couple of satellites, but this was no typical mission, and the events of that day would have a lasting effect on the entire spaceflight industry. Satellites released by the space shuttle were fitted with something called a payload assist module, which performs a very similar job to the upper stage of a conventional rocket. It's an engine that is designed to push the satellite into its final orbit. That way, they don't have to move the whole shuttlecraft to any particular orbit just to release its cargo. In this case, both satellites were going to geostationary orbit at over 22,000 miles away from Earth, far above the 600-mile maximum altitude of the shuttle. But as the payload assist module flew away into the distance, the crew saw its exhaust plume change from a steady stream to a big puff of gas. That wasn't good. The engine nozzle had snapped off mid-burn, and that meant the payload didn't have enough thrust to reach the correct orbit, so the two satellites, Palapa and Westar, were still deployed into space, but they were in the wrong orbit, essentially rendering them useless. This kind of situation is rare, the vast majority of spaceflight missions are successful, but what happens when things go wrong? You see, satellites are very expensive, especially back in the mid-80s. We didn't have thousands of them flying overhead, and any smart business working on such a high-value project is going to take out an insurance policy. Enter Lloyd's of London, a global insurance market that was founded in London City in the year 1688. This place is immense. It's largely modernized now, but back in 1984, it was still the kind of establishment where you'd find men sitting on wooden benches, writing with quill pens and ink pots. So the thought of having a satellite insured here was kind of funny, a dramatic collision of the old world and the new. 
The way Lloyd's works isn't like a typical insurance company. It's a collective of underwriters, extremely wealthy individuals who are often backed by small groups of slightly less wealthy individuals, and all of these rich people come together to put up their money and cover the risk on the world's most expensive products, from ships to skyscrapers to satellites. Lloyd's has even insured Mariah Carey's voice for $35 million, and they famously paid out 1 million British pounds to the owner of the doomed Titanic, who had negotiated an insurance policy on his unsinkable ship for 7,500 pounds. This same legendary group also insured both the Palapa B-2 and Westar 6 satellites. So, when they failed to successfully deploy, Lloyd's underwriters had to pay $180 million for the pair. In 1984 money, that was colossal, the largest space insurance loss ever. And these London aristocrats weren't ready to just take the loss and move on. Having paid out the premiums on the two satellites, the underwriters were now the owners of that property, and what they owned were two perfectly good satellites that just happened to be in the wrong place. Trying to put them back in the correct place wasn't an option. They were stuck in an elliptical or oval-shaped orbit that took them between 150 miles and 600 miles above the Earth. So in order to get them up to the intended 22,000 miles altitude, they'd need to be fitted with a brand new PAM engine, which was considered an impossible task to carry out in orbit. But the satellites still had value. They could easily be sold to anyone who is in need of a communication satellite for a much cheaper price than building a new one from scratch. This way, the underwriters could recover a large portion of the money that they'd just paid out. Now, all they needed was for someone to go and fetch their satellites. This particular underwriter, Stephen Merritt, was a smart guy. He knew that NASA was eager to demonstrate the capabilities of their new space shuttle orbiter. He knew that the MMU jetpack and the shuttle's robotic Canada arm had been specifically designed for just this kind of mission, recovering and repairing satellites in orbit. So Merritt went to NASA and made his case. Lloyds would fund the missions and pay NASA $10 million to recover the two satellites and return them to Earth so that Lloyds could resell them. The underwriters would still be taking a loss on the deal, but the recovery would save them a few million dollars, which in their eyes was worth all of the effort. Of course, that effort would be taken on by the best of the best of NASA's astronaut corps. The agency began training mission specialists Dale Gardner and Joseph Allen to use the MMU jetpack in a recovery scenario. Meanwhile, NASA invented a new tool that the men could use to grapple the satellite the Apogee Capture device, which was nicknamed the Stinger. It would be mounted in front of the astronaut, they'd approach the satellite and insert the tip of the Stinger into the nozzle of a maneuvering thruster, then they pull a lever and the tip of the Stinger expands out into the combustion chamber of the thruster and digs into the sides. This gives the astronaut a firm lock on the satellite, and now they can use the MMU to maneuver it back to the shuttle. Then all they need to do is attach a clamp to the bottom of the satellite that would allow the Canada arm to grab it. Then the robotic arms would position the object in the payload bay of the shuttle where it would be locked down for the return trip back to Earth. One of the design elements of the shuttle was that it would be able to bring stuff back from space, but this would be the first time that was really put to the test. So with a solid plan in place, the Space Shuttle Discovery launched on November 8th, 1984 on NASA's first rescue mission. But of course, things didn't go quite to plan. For their first attempt, the shuttle tracked down Palapa B-2 maneuvering to within a few hundred feet of the object at an altitude of 210 miles. Ground controllers had already used the satellite's guidance thrusters to bring it down as low as possible and get the speed of rotation to just about 1 RPM. Astronauts Gardner and Allen loaded into their spacesuits and set up in the open payload bay of the orbiter. On the first catch, Allen would lead in the MMU and Gardner would assist from the payload bay. Inside the shuttle, mission specialist Anna Fisher would be operating the Canada arm. And with all of the pieces in place, it's go time. Alan sets out on the MMU and approaches Palapa. He's having a bit of trouble seeing because the sun's in his eyes, but he manages to successfully insert the stinger into the thruster nozzle and deploy the grappling hooks. 
Now, he's riding a satellite. Alan uses the MMU thrusters to cancel out the rotation of the object and stabilize it for the return trip. Everything appears to be going according to plan until Gardner tries to attach the clamp to Palapa and it doesn't fit. Somewhere along the line, someone miscalculated the actual dimensions of the satellite with its antenna retracted, so they can't attach the hardware, which means there's nothing for the Canada arm to grab onto. They can't use it to maneuver the satellite into its final position. But these people are astronauts. They don't give up, so they improvised. But the thing about Joe Allen is that he's not a large man, five foot six with a slender build, but he was a state champion wrestler in high school, so Allen fell back on what he knew. He was going to wrestle the satellite into place by hand. While Anna Fisher used the Canada arm to hold the satellite by the stinger, Allen traded in the MMU for a foot harness that would lock down his boots while he manhandled Palapa. This is probably one of the most spectacular and underappreciated videos ever recorded. One human being standing like a statue of Atlas holding a 1200 pound satellite over his head attached by the feet to a spaceship that is hurtling around the Earth. At the same time, Gardner is bolting the mounting plate to the bottom of the object. Of course, both Allen and the satellite are weightless at this point, so he's able to maneuver the massive object without much strength, but that doesn't make this an easy job. Palapa is so big that Allen can't see what he's doing, and if he lets the satellite bang against the side of the shuttle, it might cause serious damage. After six hours in space and having completed the most eventful spacewalk in human history, the two men finally returned to the shuttle. And then the next day, they did it all over again for the Westar satellite, except this time, Gardner was on the MMU recovery, and this time the grappling clamp fit, which meant that the Canada arm was able to do all of the heavy lifting, and the second satellite was put to bed in just half the time. With the payload secured, our crew triumphantly returned to Earth, proving that the shuttle was capable of not just putting heavy things into space, but bringing them back down as well. While technically the entire mission objective was to save a bunch of money for a few rich people, this flight should be truly remembered as an epic milestone for NASA, the shuttle program, and human spaceflight. The crew redefined what was possible in outer space. Unfortunately, this new beginning would meet an abrupt end soon after. What we just watched would be the final use of the MMU. In January 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded on its way to orbit. The tragedy resulted in a massive change to US space policy. The shuttle would no longer be used to carry commercial satellites. The orbiters would only ever be flown when absolutely necessary, and NASA would put a halt to the type of high-risk space cowboy operation that was best exemplified by the Palapa satellite recovery.